What should we know that we don't know about this disease at this point? And maybe just as important, when will we find out? Well, in terms of what we don't know, there's still many things we don't know. Um, there's been a lot of fixation on, on what is the case fatality rate. So in other words, what percentage of people who get the disease will die from the disease. Uh, and there's been some controversy about which of those numbers is correct. Uh, as you may have heard uh, our president on Hannity yesterday uh, disputing the WHO figure of about 3.4%. That number is probably not um, correct, and here's why. That number is a, an average of the case fatality rates for a number of different countries. Um, and what will be the case fatality rate in one country is not necessarily what you'll see in another because you have different kinds of healthcare systems, different levels of infection control and, and preparedness, so that you're going to see a range of numbers from place to place. So looking at averages isn't really helpful here. Um, I do think this is worse than the regular seasonal flu, uh, and, and we need to really focus on the populations most at risk. So that is the elderly, especially people in their 70s, 80s, and above. But we do see an increased risk over the age of 50. Um, the other groups that we worry about are people with chronic medical conditions, and that includes a whole host of things. So that could be heart and lung disease, liver disease, kidney disease, somebody who has right. diabetes, uh, somebody who has autoimmune disease or needs to be on immunosuppressive drugs, somebody who's currently undergoing treatment for cancer. So there's a wide range of people. And we should never forget our healthcare workers uh, who put themselves on the front lines at risk for exposure. And if we see a lot of healthcare workers getting infected, that could cause a lot of problems downstream for the rest of the health system. So um, I'd just like to hop in here. You know, a few years ago, I sat next to um, Dr. Tom Friedan, who was the uh, head of the CDC. And at that time, he made the comment that we should expect um, that there would be many more communicable diseases uh, coming through. He had already cited SARS and Zika and Ebola, et cetera. Um, and uh, I just wonder a little bit, why is it that uh, the medical community seems to have been a little bit backfooted in this instance? Um, it, 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 perhaps it's not that the medical community is backfooted. Perhaps it's that the rest of the world wasn't paying attention um, to this risk. I had written a, an article about uh, why this was being a, a mar um, an, an, an issue that was being discounted in the market. Could you just talk to us a little bit about what you think has been missing um, in terms of the broader discourse in public policy and in financial markets, and, and, and more importantly, how can we improve? Because this sounds like the prevalence and incidence of these communicable diseases is going to only increase um, in years to come. And what sorts of things we should be doing to, to uh, avert a, a further crisis? Well, one of the big lessons after Ebola was understanding that this is a problem that crosses different sectors. It's not just about health and medicine and, and workers in those fields. You really need to have Department of Defense, uh, you know, finance, uh, all across the board. You need people involved. In, in the response. And I, I think a big mistake was that the White House Office of Pandemic Preparedness and Response uh, at the National Security Council was eliminated. And you really need uh, that high level intersectoral collaboration on these kinds of issues. So that was a big mistake. I also think, and I, don't, I really don't understand this one, um, why is it that we approach our military uh, defense security differently from the way we approach our biosecurity. So you would never say, let's just build a wall around the country and put our military at the wall. Let's get rid of all the foreign bases. Um, you would never do that. That would not make any sense at all. And so we need to think about global health in that same way. So there's a reason we need to be on the ground helping build up surveillance systems in countries around the world. That's an essential part of our biosecurity. And it's, yes, we're helping them. We're doing something that will be good for those countries as well. But it's very much a self-interested kind of outreach. Dr. Gounder, obviously the primary risk here is to uh, health, health crisis and people's uh, ability to uh, to get health care if they are dealing with the, the virus itself. But the secondary concern and something that people like me have to think about is what is the economic cost going to be here? And if we start to see sort of even a sort of a soft quarantine or self, uh, I, self you know, sort of self decreed isolation where people are staying home from school, staying home from work, we know that's going to have an economic cost. So my question for you is, if that starts to happen, how long do people you expect people are going to need to hunker down to wait for this to pass because it very matters very much how long that period of time lasts until we can kind of gauge what kind of economic shock this is going to ultimately uh, constitute. Well, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball any more than you do, but I think a couple things I would say is 
what we're really trying to do is slow the spread of the infection. And once you have, once you get to the point of community spread throughout the country, then some of these measures may not really be helpful anymore because the cat's out of the bag fully, so to speak. Um, so at that point, you may really just focus on, say, nursing homes and the elderly and doing what you can to prevent their exposure because they're at highest risk. But you know, if it's everywhere, does it make sense to have people working from home? Maybe, maybe not anymore. So it's really trying to buy us some time right now um, that we may be making some of these recommendations because if you if you have the, these big spikes in cases at hospitals, that will cause a problem. It will make working conditions unsafe for nurses and doctors. It'll lead to delays in healthcare. You know, if you come in with a stroke and the emergency room is flooded with patients, you're not gonna get attention for that stroke as quickly as under normal circumstances. So what we want is to try to at least smooth out how these cases develop over time and buy ourselves some time, be a little bit more prepared. Um, you know, but I, I think inevitably this probably will spread through much of the population over time. We just want to try to limit the, the fallout from that. So, so, Doctor, I think maybe an ultimate question we all have that's for ourselves, for our families, but also for corporate leadership, for investors, is how bad could it get? We had Bill Gates write in the New England Journal of Medicine that he thinks we should take seriously the possible. This is along the lines of the Spanish flu, and he gave it two reasons. One is what he called the efficiency of the disease, that one person can give it to two or three other people, and the other is the lethality, not just for some of the people who are compromised, like you said, but some healthy people. Is he right? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to say he's right or wrong, per se, but I think the worst case scenario is the Spanish flu. Um, that's certainly sort of the upper limits of what we might see with this. Um, I think one good thing is we haven't seen uh, younger people affected by this in the same way that we did with the Spanish flu. I mean, really, the, the largest burden has been in people over the age of 50, and especially people over the age of 70. And as I mentioned earlier, people with chronic medical conditions who could be younger and healthcare workers. And healthcare workers are being, are potentially uh, at risk for being exposed not once, but many times and in much larger doses. You know, if you remember Dr. Li, the ophthalmologist in China, well, think about when somebody examines your eye with what we call an ophthalmoscope, that special scope with a light that they use to look into your eyes. They're, they're literally face to face with you. So that mm -hmm. those are just very different exposures than the average person is mm -hmm. likely to have. Mm -hmm. so just really quickly, a point of clarification. When you say it's, it could be akin to the Spanish flu, are you talking about the notional numbers? Because there was about 50 million, but the world's population was much smaller at that time. Or are you talking about proportionately? Um, uh, Larry Summers, who's a contributor on this program, put out a statement, uh, or an article yesterday in the Washington Post, where he thought that the upper bounds would probably be sort of worse case scenario around the 7 million um, uh, mortality rate. I'm not saying that that's, that's better or worse, but I'm just trying to understand what your reference point is in terms of that, uh, that comment about Spanish flu. Yeah, I'm, re I'm referring to the case fatality rate. So right. upper, upper limits of, of 2%. I think most likely, most likely we're probably looking at more in the 0. 0.6 to 0.8% range, at least mm -hmm. as would be a, a, applicable to us, at least based on the uh, data that we're seeing out of countries like Singapore and and um, and so on that are with health systems that are more similar to ours. Um, so I think you know part of the problem right now is not every country's healthcare system is comparable. And so what you see in terms of statistics coming out of China is not necessarily exactly what you're going to see here.